Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. All right, well, welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Joan Ash. Today we're going to be talking to Peter Hess. He's the president of Albany Steel and Wendy Birch. He's the director of the Tenbrook Mansion. The book is called People of Albany, the First 200 Years. So welcome. Thank you. Joe. So people are probably wondering why the Tenbrook Mansion people would be here, but Peter is going to be donating the um, proceeds of the sale of this book to the Tenbrook Mansion. Why don't, you, why don't we start there? You can tell us how you got involved with them, and then Wendy you can tell us about the Tenbrook Mansion. Well, I started about 15 years ago. I started uh, writing articles for the Albany Rural Cemetery, and we were researching the people that were buried in Albany Rural and had lived in Albany, and they were very, very interesting and, and remarkable people. So as I accumulated the articles, I started putting them together in books. But the most recent book, the one on the first 200 years of Albany, had a lot of people in it who were not buried in Albany Rural. So when we put the book together, I spoke to Wendy and asked her if the Albany County Historical Association would like to distribute it and make the funds from it, and she agreed. Okay. So, Wendy, tell us about the Tenbrook Mansion, how, um, what goes on down there. And sure. Um, the Tenbrook Mansion is the headquarters of the Albany County Historical Association. They, okay, the, the, histor the Historical Association runs the... Runs That's right. Okay. Yep. We run it as a historic house museum. and. Um, you know, we do a series of events. We do lectures. We do exhibits. We have an archaeology camp for children. Uh, you know, we're really um, committed to educational outreach in the in the community. And um, I'd actually seen Peter speak um, over a little over a year ago, and I, you know, it was a wonderful talk. And he obviously is very knowledgeable about Albany history. And so I had approached him to come and, and do a talk at the Tenbrook Mansion. And uh, and since then we've um, collaborated on on a few things. And Peter was so generous to. Um, offer this chance to print uh, print the book and and let us get the proceeds from it, which we're very very grateful for. Um, you know, and we kind of did this in honor of the quadricentennial. Okay. Well, your other here. books, Peter was telling me that your articles for the Albany Rule were collected in three books, which we own at the library. I'll just mention them: People of Albany, The Second Two Hundred Years, The Civil War, and The Albany Rural Cemetery. And who were the people of Albany? And these are all little biography, biographical sketches of people buried in Albany Rural. And you said that each of these books sold over a thousand copies. Yeah, the very first one I did was the one called "Who Are the People of Albany," and that's just a listing of all the important and interesting people we found at Albany Rural. There are about three or four hundred of them. Mm -hmm. And then from that, I started researching the individuals a little more thoroughly, and I wound up with three books: "The People of Albany for the First Two Hundred Years." then the Civil War, all of the people from Albany who were involved in the Civil War and all of the Civil War activities that happened here in Albany. And then the, more, the, uh, the other one was the uh, people of Albany, the most recent 200 years, the second 200 years. So it covers 400 years of Albany history. And what are some of the, can you say some of the last names of some of the people in there and the people well, get, I mean, get an you, idea of who, from our United States history, who's, who's buried in there? Well, I mean, there's an enormous amount of uh, uh, United States history. I mean, the Schuylers and the Van Rensters are all buried in Albany Rural, and they were all from Albany. But a lot of the background information that led up to the Hamilton Burr duel all happened in Albany. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the 1754 Constitutional Convention, where where uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin first presented the Albany Plan, which is the the background of our United States Constitution, happened in Albany. Robert Yates uh, drafted a paper called Anti-Federalist Paper Number 84, which became the basis of our Bill of Rights. Uh, there's just a tremendous amount of history that originated in all of Well, those are the ones I picked out to talk about here. So. <laughs> <laughs> but if, so if this book sells as good as the other three, then you guys should, be, should make some, should yes. get some money on this. Well, the, um, the book, People of Albany, the first 200 years, like Peter just said, covers a lot of events. There's over 50 little um, sketches, most of them are about 10 or 12 pages. There's biographies, there's historical events, there's little unknown stuff, there's historical firsts, there's stories about highwaymen. 
the murder at Cherry Hill, Albany's Poor House, the, the Orphan Asylum, the first passenger railroad was in our area, the Pinkster Fest. And um, you say in, the, um, in, what, in your other book that Albany is the oldest continually settled municipality in the original 13 colonies. So that's obviously a lot of history to, <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to have well, there. The, the very first settlement in the United States was Jamestown. And Jamestown was settled in 1607. But in 1699, Jamestown was abandoned. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamestown is a, just an archaeological site in the National Park today. No one lives in Jamestown. And then in 1609, Henry Hudson first came into the Albany area, but the Dutch ship captains started coming almost immediately thereafter. And in 1613, a gentleman by the name of Hendrik Kortezen built the first permanent structure down in, near the port of Albany. What year was that? Uh, 16, okay, 16, 16, 12, 1613. Um, that was Fort Nassau, and he built a fort and a permanent trading house, and he left about a dozen traders at Albany to trade year-round with the Indians. And as far as I can see, uh, that's the first permanent structure mm -hmm. that was constructed in the original 13 colonies, which makes Albany the oldest continuous uh, municipality, the oldest continuous settlement in the original 13 okay. colonies. Well, your book is laid out in um, sort of chronological. The sections are the Dutch, the English, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, early 1800s, after 1850, and then the last section is called early 1900s. But at the end of the introduction to this, and I'll ask you this because I'm going to ask you what precedes this. At the end of the introduction, you say, armed with this positive outlook on my hometown, <laughs> I did research and wrote the book. But tell us why you're laughing and what preceded this positive outlook thing. Well, I was born and brought up in Albany, and as a result, knew absolutely nothing about the history of <laughs> Albany, which I think is the case with just about everyone else that I talk to is from Albany. But as I got involved and I found out, for instance, that Albany, I think, was the oldest continuous uh, settlement, I found that a lot of the, uh, the uh, history of Albany was, was really very important. We hear all the time that the Dutch basically robbed the land from the Indians for beads and trinkets, which wasn't at all the case. We hear all the time that European diseases wiped out the Indians. But if you actually go back and study these people, the Indians were a Stone Age people. They had not yet invented the wheel. Uh, they couldn't weave cloth. And all of a sudden, the Dutch came along, and the Dutch had things like knives, metal knives. Uh, they had clothing. They had uh, things like axes and hatchets. And that was very important to the Indians. The Indians spent their winters uh, trapping furs. They brought them to Albany, and they traded it for wampum. <coughs> wampum was called siwan locally. And that's where the misunderstanding came along, that they were, being, they were trading for beads and trinkets, because the wampum was beads. But they went around to the, to the trading posts in Albany with their, with their wampum, and they traded the wampum for things that they wanted, such as boots and clothing and hatchets and knives. And those type of implements uh, tremendously raised the standard of living for the local uh, natives. Well, a little bit further on, past the introduction, you say that um, a lot of the Dutch history was, was um, lost, replaced by the derogatory English versions. So what, um, was it actually in some of the things you just said, is it, was it actually in history books that these, are you, is your book sort of a, are you trying to correct history or trying to tell the real? Well, I'm trying to tell the story that I found when I researched the individuals, when I researched the individual Van Rensselaers, when I, entered, when I researched the individual Schuylers, and the story that their papers tell is not at all the story that you get in the general history books that's uh, distributed today. And uh, that's what I try to present in the book. And what, what kind of um, research did you do when you said their papers? Were you actually reading papers from the 17 and 1600s? Or where did yeah. you do all your research? Well, we were very fortunate here in Albany. We had some of the very earliest printers uh, were located in Albany. Going back into the 1700s, we had a newspaper here in Albany, the Albany Gazette, prior to the Revolutionary War. So a lot of the documentation from the early Albany still exists. And you can go back to some of these early publications and early books, and you can, you can find this information, and, and uh, you can use it for autobiographies where, where, of and people. Where did you do your research? Where did you get these papers? Are they at the State Library? Or, uh, well, there's, uh, I found a whole series of books. Uh, Norman Rice, who's a retired 
uh, head of the Albany Institute of History and Art, took oh, okay. me to lunch one day, and he took me to an old uh, antique uh, bookstore in downtown Albany, and he started saying, well, you need to buy those four and these 12 mm -hmm. and those two, and I think by the time I was done, a few months later, I had spent over $5,000 on old antique mm -hmm. Albany books. And uh, that's actually how I got started. A lot of the information that I got started with there, I was able to follow up with research on the internet, research through the, uh, the uh, uh, New York State Library. There's a, there's a large program that's going on right now, Dr. Gehring, uh, the New Netherlands Institute down at the, uh, down at the uh, uh, Education Department. For the very first time, they're going back and they're taking the old Dutch records and they're translating it into English. So up until recently, all of the Dutch records that existed prior to 1662 obviously were in Dutch and the English couldn't read it. And we really didn't have a real good picture of what the history had been under the Dutch until recently when these documents are being transcribed. Okay, so the English obviously wrote, wrote the history after, <laughs> after well, that. Yeah, the English wrote the history after 1662, okay. but they really didn't know it. Yeah. Uh, there was a conflict between the Dutch and the English over the English taking over mm -hmm. Albany, so the relationship never was good. There was always, uh, there was always uh, some conflict there, on top of which the English couldn't read Dutch. Okay. Well, one thing you were telling me before we started, <clears throat> which I found really interesting, like you just mentioned, when you're doing research about the people as opposed to the events, you, you got more what you feel is like the real story. Tell us the difference between researching the people and historical events. Well, in, in my earlier book, I researched there are two uh, survivors of the Titanic that are buried in Albany Rural. Oh. And I went back and I found letters that they had written. I found interviews that they had given to the news, newspapers here locally. These are the kinds of things you wouldn't find in a history book, obviously. Well, if you went to, into a history book and you researched the Titanic, you would get one story. If mm -hmm. you go back and you research Gilbert Tucker, and you actually find the letters that Gilbert Tucker wrote, and you, write the inter and you read the interviews that Gilbert Tucker gave with the local newspapers, you get an entirely mm -hmm. different story than the story that you, that you see in the movie, for instance, or yeah. that you read in the history books about the Titanic. And the people that were with him, they also wrote letters, and they also were interviewed by their local newspapers, both in New York City and Philadelphia. And the story that they gave is entirely different than the movie. The only, the only similarity between what really happened in the movie is that the ship sank. Okay. <laughs> Other than that, I wouldn't believe anything. Well, at the, at the very end of your introduction, which we're talking about here, we'll get to the book in a second, but <laughs> you say, going on with events and people, you say, the true story is remarkable and dramatically different, meaning the true story in your book. What, what, what did you mean by, by that little statement? Well, I mean the true story of the original, the original fur traders. I mean, I explained that a minute ago, that the, the story that you hear from most of the historians and the story that you hear in the major media is entirely different mm -hmm. from what really happened. Um, that, that's an example, but, uh, you know, again, if you look at the individuals and what they say and go right back to the original documentation, you get a different story than when you look at the overall okay, picture. Well, this, I think, will be a good example of it. We'll start with one of your chapters in here is about the Albany Congress. Um, it's, it's probably the second longest section. It's about 20 pages. Most of them are shorter. But this was way before the Continental Congress, and it involves many of the colonies, Ben Franklin, the Indians, and it was sort of the first attempt at a at a um, confederation, is that the right word? But tell us about this chapter and what the Albany Congress was and it's sort of well, a little-known little known part of history. <laughs> well, that was during the uh, French and Indian War. Okay. And uh, the colonists were unhappy because the British were not providing them with enough protection. So the colonists said, let's all get together and set up a method of taxation and join together and let's start our own army. And, and this was all the colonies involved, or? This, this was the uh, 13 original okay. colonies. I think there were nine of them that showed up for the meeting. Okay. And the meeting was held in downtown Albany, right in, the, right in front of what today is SUNY Plaza. And this is 20 years before the, the Declaration of Independence. 20 years okay. before the Declaration okay. of Independence. And they had the meeting down there, and at the meeting they did two things. Number one, they got together and they, they, they agreed to... Uh, to draft the Albany Plan. The Albany Plan had been drafted by uh, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, 
and it, it, it arranged, it organized the, the uh, setup of the, of the original colonies, how they were going to tax, how they were going to vote, that now, whole operation. Now, was Ben Franklin here in Albany for that? Definitely. Oh. Ben Franklin was here in Albany several times. That was only okay. one of several times that Benjamin Franklin was here in Albany. And then the second part was they met with the local Indians because they wanted the Indians to not get involved with the war or to, to support the local settlers. And the Indian, Indians didn't show up for several days. They'd been having some problems with the Indians. When the Indians did show up, they sat down and they met with the Indians. Uh, Philip Schuyler was a leader of the, of the uh, colonial uh, representatives during the meeting with the Indians. He was the, um, the main United States Indian representative at the time. And they worked out a deal with the Indians where the Indians were going to support the colonists. So it was a two, two prong uh, uh, meeting. First was to adopt the, the Albany Plan, the Constitution, and the second one was to meet with the Indians and get their support in the French and Indian War. Now, what ever happened with that Albany Plan? It never, was it adopted? Well, Great Britain wasn't too happy about it because they didn't really want the colonies <laughs> joining together. They might get the idea that maybe they should be independent and they really didn't need Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So Great Britain opposed it, and as a result of Great Britain opposing it, it didn't really go any further. But the colonies did work together for their own protection and so, provided soldiers to each other. All right, so I never knew that. So the, the genesis of the next 20 years, it was obviously the talk of, of the colonies to try and band together. And I like how you, in, in your book, you talk about all these kinds of events. Where were they, where would they meet in Albany when they, like, there was a, Franklin came to the, yeah. Well, there was a building called the State House, H A U S, mm -hmm. which was Dutch for State House. And at the time it was located right in front of what today is SUNY Plaza, the Dean H Plaza. Okay. The building was out there in that park area right in front of the Dean H Plaza. There's a memorial plaque there today, oh, okay. but that was the Albany City Hall and that's where the that's where the meeting was held where Franklin presented his plan, and then where the Indians showed up, and they negotiated with the Indians. All right. Well, uh, that was um, just an example of the kind of stories in this book. And um, another one here, this is the longest section of the book. It's about 35 pages. It's called um, The Committee of Safety and the Battle of Saratoga. And it's basically almost, from what I read, reading this section, 17 months before the Declaration of Independence, these guys got together, I'll read some of the last names in a second, and almost the document was sort of like the Declaration of Independence. Well, tell us about this section. Um, it's very interesting. Well, the, um, the people of Albany saw that the revolution was approaching, <laughs> and the Dutch of Albany, I think, were more likely to break off from Great Britain and some of the English colonies. Um, so they got together and they formed a committee of safety because they knew that once the Declaration of Independence was was uh, signed and executed, that they wouldn't have a government because the mayor of Albany was, was appointed by the King of England <laughs> and all the judges were appointed by the King of England. So once the, the revolution started, they, the Albany would not have a government. So the leaders of Albany, the Schuylers, the Van Rensselaers, they got together and they formed this committee of safety. And the committee of safety worked quietly for the first year or so until the Declaration of Independence was actually signed. And once the Declaration of Independence was signed, they arrested the mayor, <laughs> Mayor <laughs> Kyler, and the, and the Committee of Safety took over all the records of Albany and then actually ran Albany after that and throughout the uh, Revolutionary War. Well, some of the people that signed this document, I mean, people will know these last names from if they know their history. Van Rensselaer, Schuyler, Livingston, Bleeker, Lansing, Yates, Tenbrook. Um, the last name, I don't know how you pronounce it, but in parentheses, Niskayuna, Saratoga. Um, so there's a lot of, again, there's just one example of over the 50 stories in here. Um, why don't we talk about, um, uh, oh, some, one of the things you talk about in here, the Hamilton Burr, very famous incident in American history, but the whole thing, started, I guess you could say, the, all the back and forth with the Hamilton Burr were in the Albany newspapers. Tell us about the Hamilton Burr and its connection with our area, with Albany. Well, I mean, Alexander Hamilton was uh, Philip Schuyler's son-in-law, mm -hmm. and they were both very strong Federalists. And um, Aaron Burr also was an attorney in Albany. He had an office down on Pearl Street in Albany. 
And they both were located in Albany a lot of the time because this is where the state legislature was. This is where all the action was. <laughs> Burr and Hamilton did not get along because Burr was backing one faction of the party and Hamilton was backing a, di a different faction of the party. But Hamilton was here arguing a case before the New York State Court of Appeals when Burr was here. <clears throat> and Burr was running for governor. Burr had previously run for President of the United States, and he wound up in a tie. <clears throat> and in that tie, it was, it was roundly felt that Hamilton had caused the tie between Jefferson and Burr. And Hamilton had swung the Federalist votes to Jefferson, which got Jefferson elected in Congress over Burr. So there was a hard feeling to begin with. Burr then came back to New York and decided that he wanted to run for governor. And the word was out that uh, the Federalists, which were, who were headed by uh, Alexander Hamilton, were going to back Burr. And, and Hamilton was at, a, was at a dinner down at Judge John Taylor's house, down at 50 State Street, right here in <laughs> Albany. And at that dinner, Hamilton was asked by Judge Taylor's son-in-law if he was going to back Burr. And Hamilton said, no, that Burr was a dangerous man who ought not be trusted. And, it, and within a week or so, that comment appeared in the Albany Register newspaper. <clears throat> and m m many of the supporters of Burr read about it. But Burr did not read about it. He never heard about it. It was later printed again in the New York Post. Hamilton owned the New York Post, so he must have known that the, that the letter was being printed down there. Next to the letter that was printed in the New York Post was a letter from Philip Schuyler, Hamilton's father-in-law, saying that that had never happened and that comment had never been made. The election was held. Burr lost the election. He was sick. He wasn't feeling well. One of his supporters brought him a copy of the Albany Register newspaper, the one that didn't have the letter from Philip Schuyler, and he showed it to Burr. And Burr became infuriated. And that was when he demanded an apology from Hamilton. Hamilton wouldn't give it to him. Okay. Burr challenged him to the duel. And the duel was held down in Weequawka, New Jersey, yeah. which was one of the few places in the United States where dueling was <laughs> legal. It wasn't legal in Albany, obviously. Yeah, the, the, duel. the duel didn't actually happen in Albany, really? but the, the dinner had happened in <laughs> Albany. The, the court case had happened in Albany. The, the running for governor, all that happened in Albany. Both of them were, were practicing in Albany at that time. So a lot of it happened right so here. So if duels were legal then, it, the duel could have been in Albany, maybe. <laughs> no, well, the, the uh, dueling was not legal in New York. Oh, in New York. Was, that's, why they, that's why they rode across the Hudson River to Weehawken, New Jersey, <laughs> and had the duel over there. Well, um, I'm going to just talk about one more thing. And again, th these are the kinds of stories that are in this book, and not just on famous people and events, but here's an example of one of them. You have a, a little section here about the Pinkster Fest, which we've all been to many times, and it's, it was called Albany's Mardi Gras, or the African Dutch holiday. Why don't you tell us about the origin of our Pinkster Fest, which still goes on today? Yeah, well, the Pinkster Fest was one of the big celebrations in Albany, going back all the way to the 1600s. But as time went on, sometime in the early 1700s, the black residents of Albany actually took over the Pinkster Fest and started running it. And most of the people who ran the Pinkster Fest had, been previous, had previously been slaves. And they had a parade, and they had all sorts of activities. How down. large was the black population then? Do you, did you have any I really don't know what the black population, but it must have been substantial. Yeah, well, they had a, okay. So then they had a... And it also says in the old Albany books that there were hundreds of black people that arrived for the three-day celebration okay. that was held on Pinkster Hill, which had to be located someplace near where the Capitol is located okay. today. But Pinkster Hill was the location of the Pinkster Fest, and they had all sorts of activities that went on all day long. They had a, they had a king of the Pinkster who was Charlie, and Charlie, I can't remember Charlie's last name, but Charlie was dressed up in a brigadier general's uniform from the British Army. He had on a red coat and uh, gold uh, uh, epitaphs on it, and uh, he was the uh, king of the festival. They had that down there for years. Wow, so and then the con it's over 400 years now they've continued. But the Pinkster Fest, that's 400, you said the 16, 1600s it started. Yeah, the Pinkster Fest started in the mid-1600s, oh, wow. and, and Albany still holds a Pinkster okay. Fest. Well, these are just some of the stories in this book, and it's over 400 pages, over 50. 
And if you like these little stories Peter's been telling, he's going to be here at the library on November 22nd. It's a Sunday. He'll be here at 2 o'clock speaking about a lot of the a lot of stories in this book. And Wendy, the book is also on sale down at the Tenbrook Mansion. Why don't you tell us when you guys, you guys are open, what, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Yeah, we're actually there all week, um, oh, okay. at least I'm Monday sorry. through Friday from 9.30 to 4. So anyone who's interested in picking up a copy, I would uh, recommend maybe just giving a quick call first. But um, And we can also uh, mail it out. But if people, people want to go down, down and there. see the mansion. You can, uh, what, what do you have down there? You take a tour, you have gardens. Yep. You can... um, and we're kind of off season now, so oh, okay. call for an appointment. Um, but we do, uh, we will be decorated through the month of December for the okay. holidays, and we have a lot of events going on then. All right, very good. So the book's on sale down at the Tenbrook Mansion. It's on sale at the Book House in Stuyvesant Plaza. If you come here on November 22nd at the library, Peter will have books for sale. Will you have your other ones? For sale too. You bring some of your other ones. We yes, we can do that. Okay, and then um, so well. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. And um, thank you. So that's it for Meet the Author, and we'll see you next time. Bye.